praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy, God. We thank you, Lord, for picking us up out of that miry clay. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Be lifted up, Lord. Be lifted up this morning. Be high and lifted up. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, would you come, Lord? Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Found in your hands, fullness of joy.
presence of the Lord. Praise Him in your own words this morning. It's so good to be in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. So good to be in the presence of the Lord. You may be seated this morning in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. There's no time like time spent in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Well, once again, it's my privilege and honor to be able to fill in uh, this pulpit uh, for, for Brother Perry, expecting to, to come back here on, on Wednesday. I know uh, he was expecting to be here this morning. He just doesn't have a voice. And so you can't preach if you don't really, like the way he likes to preach if you don't have a voice, kind of like a singer. If I don't have a voice, I don't consider myself a singer, but if I don't have a voice, it just frustrates me. I can't. I can't do anything, so as far as praise out externally, you know, and so uh, just continue to pray for him. I know uh, Sister Susie's nursing him back to health, and uh, so he's, he's doing good. Just pray that he'll be back um, ready to preach. I know he's had messages burning, um, and so I know he'll be ready to come back and, and preach the word, and so this morning, again, I, I, I never just take it for granted, and I just always trust the Lord to give me his word, and um, whether, whether I know in advance or whether it's just last, a last-minute thing. You know, I'm always just praying, and, and the Bible does say to be instant in season and out of season, but I, I just want to share a quick story this morning before we start um, as how this message came to be or how, how I have a release to preach this message this morning won't be your typical message, I guess, and we'll see here in a minute. But I was in Louisiana over the weekend for a cousin's wedding. Uh, she's getting married. She got married uh, yesterday um, in the evening, and so I was there. We got there Friday night kind of late. We were just kind of running. And that morning, that Saturday morning, I had breakfast with my brother. We like to spend time and fellowship, you know, over food. Um, and so we got up early in the morning just to go, uh, just to find a place to get a good breakfast and um, as we were leaving the restaurant, they had a person who walked in. They were coming in as we were walking out. My brother was, was in the front, front of me, and so they ran into each other. But it's a person that I hadn't seen in probably six or more years. And they used to go to the church where we came from, where we attended, um, our home church. I recognized his face. I just didn't remember his name at the time, but I recognized his face. You know how you do. You recognize people's faces, and you just don't remember the name sometimes, but I recognize his face. And uh, he saw me, but I just got this blank stare. Like when you see a stranger at Walmart or something, you know, there's no familiarity there, so you don't look at the stranger with familiar eyes. And so I thought that was kind of weird. You know, it's okay. Uh, and so him and my brother, they're making small talk. And they're just talking, and my brother, you know, asking him where he's going to church. And he's like, I need to get back in church and all this and that. And I'm just standing right next to my brother this whole time. And uh, he, he's just, I'm, I'm, I like don't exist, which is fine. I don't, I don't really care. But I just knew I knew this guy, and I know we've talked, you know. And so I'm just blown away. Like this guy, wow, this guy really, I guess he just doesn't recognize me. And so then he asked my brother, so who are you here with? Who's this? He's like. And I'm thinking, man, yeah, I guess you don't see a resemblance. Most people think that we resemble, but okay. 
whatever. And I'm just quiet, you know. I'm just listening. He's like, oh, I'm here with, with my brother. He's like, oh, is he the one that lives out the country? He's like, no, he, he lives here. He moved to Alabama. And, and so he's asking all these questions. And uh, he looked at me, and he, and he went to introduce himself, and I introduced myself to him. And he said, wait, I know you. I remember you. He said, I'm not good. I'm not too good with, with faces. And he said, plus, I think your hair is different than what it used to be back then or something like that. But uh, he said, I'm not good with faces, but I'm good with voices. He said, as soon as you, as soon as you said something, I know exactly who you are. And, and so we kind of, you know, kind of got the talking stuff. But it sparked something in me today because I thought, man, that's, I remember faces. I don't remember names. You know, but I, that's the first that I've heard that this guy, he goes off of voices because he works offshore and he listens to the radio all the time. And so he knows people by their voices. And I thought, man, that's a that's a great, great thought, you know, to know the voice of God and all that. You know, I'm just I didn't know I was preaching this morning. I'm just saying um, I, I began to think about that. And so this message that I'm going to share this morning is something that I've had to share in my heart for some time. But it just hadn't been the right time. It just hadn't been the right time. And I, I feel like it's the right time this morning. And I've shared a small part of it in the gap before, so they may recognize a couple of things. But I hadn't really shared much of the message. But, again, um, that what sparked this whole thing was when he said, I recognize your voice. And by your voice, I'm able to tell and differentiate you because there's, there's even people that, Think me and my brother the same guy. Remember when, when he came to visit and all this and that. But this guy said, because of the voice, I can tell the difference between people, even twins. And, um, you know, I thought that was pretty good. So we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. And I'm going to take my title from, the, from those beginning words. That's going to be the title for what we're going to talk about this morning. The title is Be Sober, Be Vigilant. And that's, how the, that's the way 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 begins. It says, be sober, be vigilant. Is there a particular reason why we have to be sober and vigilant? The particular reason is this, because your adversary, your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Be sober, be vigilant because your rival, because your opponent because you're combatant, because you're enemy, because you're foe, because you're nemesis, because you're antagonist, because the devil walks around, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And I know we know this scripture very well. And we know that a lot of times when we hear that word sober, when we're talking about sobriety, it has a lot to do with alcohol. It has a lot to do with drunkenness, being drunk or alcohol. When you hear that word sober, I've been sober for X amount of years or this and that, X amount of weeks or months or days. And hopefully we're all smart enough to know the importance of sobriety this morning in a physical sense. So I will not get into that this morning. But as it's always said from the pulpit, it's, it's always said here what's true in the natural is true in the spiritual. What you can apply in the natural, you can also apply in a spiritual sense. And so, and so what, the, what Peter was referring to here when he said sober was also talking about having a clear mind, having a serious attitude of the mind. And if there was ever a time to be serious-minded, it's today. If there was ever a time to look at the things that are said, to hear the words that are said from the pulpit, from, that's coming out of different pulpits, to be serious about it, it's now. It's not a time to play games. It's not a time to joke around. It's a time to be serious-minded of where we are and where we stand this morning, today, in this age. A clear and a serious mind can see the true nature of things. It can see things for what they really are. That's why they call it sober. You can see. You can, you can drive. You know, you can do these things. But spiritually, a clear a mind can see things for what they are based on what? Based on scriptural values. Based on what the word of God says. Hence the old song that says, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Remember it says, I once was blind, but now I see. I was once blind. I didn't see things the way they were. I didn't see things clearly. I wasn't sober. 
Not just in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense. I didn't see things the way they were, but now, thank God, I can see. Thank God I'm not blinded by my, by my own desires, blinded by my carnal nature and all the desires that that carnal nature has. But now that I've been forgiven, now that I've been washed by the blood and born again, now I'm a new creature and now I see things in a new light. That's why we can sing this song we sang this morning. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost. Why not? Why doesn't it make me want to scream and shout hallelujah, praise God? Because I knew exactly who I was before he came. And I see things in a new light. As before, I'd never think about twice about thanking God, waking up in the morning and thanking the Lord, even in business, you know, let's say a good business deal went through. I never would have never thought about God. Thank you for blessing me. Lord, thank you for making this happen. Lord, thank you for opening this door. Lord, thank you for closing this door. I would have never thought about that. But now in a new light, I can see things clearly. So before making decisions, as I see that now, as I'm a born again believer, as I'm born again, I make decisions based on what the Bible says. What does the Bible say? What does the Word of God say? Yes, it's good to get advice from other people. I get advice from people all the time, but then I also bring it back to the Word of God. What does the Word of God say about this? That's why it's important to read the Word, and we know this. This is stuff that we should know, but if we should know it, how come not a lot of people is doing it? That's why it's important to study the word, to memorize. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You want to know how to stay sober? Hide his word in your heart. Hide the word of the Lord in your heart. When we know what the word says, we can see things as they really are. And we're going to look a little deeper into that in a minute. Just laying the foundation, the groundwork. I'm so tired. I'm so tired of Christian celebrities today christian so-called celebrities that say one thing and do another thing they say one thing with their lips but do another thing with their actions i'm so tired of seeing that not just celebrities but other so-called christians people that you rub shoulders with day in and day out they say one thing with their lips but do another thing by their actions that preach messages, that sing songs that have no scriptural doctrine, no theology, but they just people just take it at face value. I'm singing this song because it's a popular song. I'm not worried about doctrine, not worried about theology. I just like the melody. I just like this, and I just like that. Well, it's time to get back to the basics. It's time to get back to the Word of God, what the Word of God says, doctrine, theology, what it says. Tired of the mysticism. Tired of the hidden Eastern and pagan practices being mixed in what's called Christianity. All this stuff that's mixed in, that when you trace it back and you study it, it goes back to the Eastern religion. All this meditation and all this stuff and breathe in and breathe out and empty yourself and all that coming in is New Age Christianity. When you look deep down into it, it's pagan worship. And it's being mixed in there. And people are swallowing it up. They swallow it up because it's somebody that says, oh, I'm a Christian. Oh, I have a thousand, you know, a hundred thousand followers. So it must be right. It worked for him. It must work. And, and so this takes place all the time. But the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant. First John 4 1. Beloved, believe not what? Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. They had many false prophets then. And they sure have many false prophets now, even more so now than they did back then. It's still the same. We know that the the word try is to test, to test something, literally or figuratively. When you try something, you're testing something. Test the spirit. Test the spirit. Discern the spirit. Examine the spirit. Prove the spirit. The spirits, whether they are of God or not. Test it. Prove it. Allow it if it's right. Don't allow it if it's not right into your life. Distinguish between. Perceive between the spirits. Recognize between the spirits. Notice between. Observe the spirits whether they are of God or not because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Be sober. It all goes back to again. Be sober. Be sober. 
to be able to distinguish and recognize between the spirits because there's many false spirits. But again, Peter didn't stop at be sober. He says, be vigilant. Those two go hand in hand. You can't have both. You, you, you have to have both. And you see, because the word vigilant means to keep a careful watch. The word vigilant means keep a sharp eye. The word vigilant means to be observant, to be on the lookout. So he's saying be of a clear mind. He says be of a clear mind and see things for what they are, but also keep a careful watch at what you're looking at. Keep a sharp eye at what's taking place. Keep a sharp eye on that person that professes to be a man or a woman of God. Keep a sharp eye on that prophet or prophetess that come and tries to prophesy or give you a word of God. Keep a sharp eye on them and watch them to see if they line up with the word of God or not. Keep a sharp eye on those persons that say, oh, I'll interpret you this dream or I'll tell you this and that. And there is that. I'm not saying there's not that. There is that. But keep a sharp eye to be able to see if it lines up with the word of God or not. That's what he's saying. And I'm, I'm defining these things, even though a lot of us know already what it means. I'm defining all these things, number one, because this is the word for the, of the Lord this morning. And number two, so we can remember that words like these carry more weight to them that are deeper and not meant just for surface level reading. When he's talking about trying the spirit, sometimes we just go through it and just read through stuff without looking at words and more words to make more sense to understand exactly what he was trying to say. Go study it yourself. All we try to do or all I try to do is to set the table as, as make it as appeasing, as enticing as possible, the table so you can go and dig in yourself, set the plate, set the food, and you come in and you dig in the word. I'm not here to do this. I'm here to hopefully you come and you want to partake and you say, I want to study more. I want to look into this more. You know, whatever Brother Paul said or whatever who and so said, I want to go back. You hear Brother Perry say it all the time. He gives a scripture and then he says, don't read it right now. What does he say? Go read it later. Why? Because he's saying, look, I'm just trying to set this table here. You come eat in your own time. You dig it in. You look into it. You, I'm giving you points that you need to go study and you need to go look at. Go study for yourself. When we're living vigilant, we recognize that there's an enemy out there, a real enemy who is after our souls and out to extinguish the life of Christ within us. Within us. Not to be taken to the extreme as I've seen of other people that believe that the devil's hiding behind a plant or that he's hiding behind a painting or he's, you, you know, just not to be taken to that extreme where we're just paranoid and fearful of everything. But he's talking about watching and knowing that not every person that's going to come into your life has their best, your best interest. Not every person that calls himself friend or brother or sister in Christ is there as, as, as a true brother or sister in Christ. Not, other, not every member that decides to come and be a member of the church is there to really help the church grow and the kingdom grow and to be a part. You understand? That's what he's saying. You just have to be sharp and vigilant. Be friendly. All that stuff. But watch their life. Watch their life. Watch the life of that person. And again, I know people will let you down, but we're going to get into more what I'm talking about here. Peter chose those two words, sober and vigilant. And I said, they go hand in hand. You can't have victory unless you have, you're both, unless you're sober and you're vigilant. Being sober is dealing with the internal. Being sober is dealing with the mind. Being sober is dealing with the spirit man. And being vigilant is dealing with the external. Being vigilant is dealing with what I feel, what I see, what I touch, different things. So, one is dealing with the inside, and the other one is dealing by the outside. Internal defense and external defense to protect us, to see. And so the devil is more worried about what you think than what you do. How's that? He's more worried about what you think than what you're doing right now. Because what you're doing right now is sitting in church. And from the outside, that looks good. But what you're thinking, you could be thinking about another woman or something. Or another man. I mean, it's just truth. 
You could be thinking about the person in the front pew or the back pew that you just don't really like. And how you're going to get them back for whatever the case is. You understand? So you're here. What you're doing is you're here. But what are you thinking? I could be up here singing, raising my hand, praising God. And what I'm thinking is something totally opposite. Man, I wish this thing just get over with. You know, I'm just ready to get out of here. You know, I got places to be. And so all this doesn't matter to him. It matters what's in here. And so the devil, again, he's more worried about that than what you do. And this world has a saying. The world says, do as I say, not as I do. That's what the world says. That's what your boss says sometimes. You know, he's your boss. And he and he's, you know, I've had those uh, worldly bosses in the in the oil field, you know, that that is the motto. Do as I say, you know, revenue, revenue, revenue. We're talking about safety and stuff, but that goes out the window when it comes time to make money and this and that. And so that's the way of the world. Do as I say. You do whatever I say, but don't worry about what I'm doing. Don't you worry about what I'm doing. And that's what a lot of preachers do. You do. What I'm telling you to do behind this pulpit or what I'm telling you to do behind, you know, Instagram or, or, or the platform that I'm using, you know, whatever it is. <clears throat> but don't worry about what I'm doing. Don't worry about the scandals. Don't worry about, you know, uh, being divorced five, six times and doing this and that. You just do as I say. You just do as I say. I use this uh, example all the time. I, I, I used to, you know. If, if I walk into my house with my shirt collar smelling like perfume, lipstick all over, shirt kind of untucked and stuff, a big grin on my face when I'm walking through the door, you know, just, just walk in like that, you think that Cajun wife of mine is just going to sit back and just smile and did you have a good time? You don't think there's going to be questions asked? You think it's going to fly if I say, oh, this is... I went to my mom's house and stuff, and, you know, I was at my mom's. You think that's going to fly? You don't think there's going to be questions? Ask. You think I'll just be able to go to the room and say, I'm going to shower. You be quiet. You know, don't ask questions. I mean, goodness, I, I'm feeling in trouble already, and this is just an example. <laughs> this is just an example, and I'm already feeling the heat. <laughs> But it's true. It's true. It wouldn't fly. We'd ask questions. We'd ask questions. And we have to ask questions when we see things that are not lining up. People that profess to be Christians and they're not lining up. And they tell you, just be quiet. I am a Christian. Just be quiet. I'm doing this. Just get out of my face. I'm, let me do what I'm doing. No, I, I got questions. Because I love you, because I care. If I didn't care, I wouldn't ask questions. I wouldn't ask if I didn't care. I'd let you do your own thing, but I care. See, the devil wants to control what you believe. Just like the media, we see that in the media today. For the most part, they, they, they want to control and condition the mind of those that are watching it. You know, saying, pounding the same thing over and over and over and over. So that's what, what's been believed. Now we're going to look at 2 Corinthians, and I'm still laying the groundwork. <clears throat> The meat of the message is it won't be too long, trust me. But 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15 says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel for who? Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers... His ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. Don't be surprised. There's false doc, false apostles, deceitful workers. They transform themselves as believers of Christ. The devil himself transformed themselves. His demons, his angels transformed themselves as the ministers of righteousness. They looked apart. They act apart. And then you look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressively 
that in the latter times, which is this, right? The latter times, the end times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. In the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. Some will leave the faith. Some people that you rub shoulders with will leave the faith. Maybe even the very people that got you into church will leave the faith. Why? Because it says right here they're going to give heed. They're going to listen to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Not doctrines about devils, but doctrines of devils. Not doctrines that says that the devil is the one true king or one true God, but doctrines that the devils endorse, doctrines that the demons endorse and say, yeah, that's good. There is no such thing as heaven and hell. Yeah, that's good. God loves everybody. Love, love knows no age. Love knows no boundaries. You can love a man and be a man and, and be a homosexual. That's, those are doctrines that are endorsed by devils. They're not necessarily talking about the devil and saying you need to worship Lucifer. But it's doctrines that are being endorsed by the devil. They put their stamp of approval on it. I like this message. We approve of this message. This is a good message. This is a good thing. Yeah, there's more than one way. Yeah, everybody, all religions are going to point to, to God in the end of the thing. You know, you get there your own way and I get there my own way. You can serve this God and that God. At the end of the day, we're all God's children. We're all, that's doctrines of devils. That's what it's talking about. Things of that nature. When Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life, the, the religious of that time, the Pharisees, what did they say? No, you're not. That's doctrines of devil. When he said, I'm the son of God, no, you're not. Doctrines of devil. I'm the bread. I'm the life. No, you're not. You have a devil. That's doctrines of devil. You cast out these demons by what? Belzadub or, or whatever they said. They're, that is doctrines of devil. That is the devil saying, no, you're not. That's antichrist, antichrist. You're not the son of God. You're just a carpenter's son. That's doctrine of the devil. It's not matching up with the word of God. That's what it's talking about. When it's talking about the doctrine, seducing spirits, stuff that sounds better, stuff that sounds good to the ears and pleasing, you don't really have to. Forsake all. You don't really have to take up your cross every day. Just some days it's okay. That's doctrines of devil. That's how he operates. They called him a liar. They said, Moses, we get our truth from Moses. You don't get your truth from God. They said, our father's Abraham. Your father's Abraham. You don't come. You're not really the, the son of God. Now we're going to look at the life of Isaac. He was vigilant, but was he sober? When you look at the life of Isaac, Genesis 27, 1 says, And it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, remember, Sobriety means a clear mind that can see. A clear mind that can see things in true light. This says, so that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son and said unto him, my son. And he said unto him, behold, here am I. We're going to jump to 16. But prior to all that, the 16, he's about to bless his son. He's talking to the real Esau here. And the mom's listening to what the conversation is. And the father and, and Isaac said, you know, I'm getting ready to bless you. Prepare my favorite meal. His favorite meal was venison. So Esau said, okay, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to, you know, hunt the venison, bring it back. And then when you come, I'm going to eat. Then I'm going to bless you. So the mother is listening this whole time. She heard, she heard the conversation. And she had the idea of, obviously, well, a lot of us know the story, but I don't want to take it for granted for those that may not. Um, she had the idea of let's, get, let's, let's let Jacob get that. And so she said, Jacob, come here. I got an idea. I got a plan. Your brother Esau is going to hunt some venison. He's going to hunt some deer for your dad, and he's going to bless him. But I have a plan. 
you're going to get the blessing instead, and this is what we're going to do. And it says that, that he was afraid. He was like, well, I don't look like him. Because the Bible says that, that Esau was a hairy man, you know, just a hairy man, a man of the outdoors. And, and his brother was the total opposite. And so he's like, I just, I, I don't look like him. You know, I don't smell like him. I'm not out there in the outdoors. I, I don't even know how to, I don't know how to cook like he does. I, I just, and this is not going to work. And she said, it's going to work. Trust me, just do what I say. And then in the Bible, you read it. She's saying, just do as I say. And so she said, go get some goats. Go kill them. And I'm going to make his venison out of those goats. Well, goats and venison, they're not the same animal. But she said, we're, he's not going to tell the difference. He's just an old man, you know, whatever. He's not going to tell the difference. With that goats that you killed, I'm going to take that skin, and I'm going to put it all over you. And he, he, he's not going to tell. He's going to discover me. No, he's not. Don't worry about it. You're going to smell like a goat. You're going you're gonna to feel like a goat. Everything, you know, you're just going to. He, he, he's going to buy into it. You just do what I say. And so Genesis 27, 16, here we are. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck. So she's putting it all over him. The skin, the, the smell of it, everything's covering this man from head to toe. Just everywhere where, um, where Isaac was going to touch. We see in verse 16 what we just read that Jacob is dressed in goat skin to feel like he was Esau. We know what the goat represents, don't we? We know that the goats and the sheep are not going to go into the same place, don't we? We know that the goat and the sheep are going to be separated. One's going to go on the right hand. One's going to go on the left hand. We know that Jesus said, I'm going to separate the goat and the sheep. We know that Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. He didn't add goats in there. He didn't say my sheep and goats, they both know my voice. He says, my sheep Know my voice. We know what the goat represents. We know that it's safe to say that the goat represents worldliness. It's safe to say that the goat represents carnality. It's safe to say that the, world, that the goat represents basically the devil. When you look at that satanic statue called the Baphomet, what is it? It's half man, half goat. The face of a goat, the, the hands of a man is holding a baby or it's doing something. It, it's, it's a goat. It's representing goat. So in the natural, it's true in the spiritual. We're looking at this right now, right here. The goat had to be everywhere on Isaac, uh, on, on, on uh, Jacob, had to be everywhere. You understand a man that has a goat has to look like the real deal. He has to look like a Christian. He has to talk like a Christian. He has to say the right things. He has to preach the right way. He has to sing the right way. But they're really a goat. And the devil knows that. In order to fool people, we have to get it as close as the real thing as we can. If we're going to fool your dad, you're going to have to feel just like your brother. Your hands, your neck, your back, everything. It's got to feel just like your brother. If we're going to deceive, because he's not just going to fall for it, because he's being vigilant, but he's not too sober. But he's being vigilant. But it's got to be like the real deal. But it's really somebody out there trying to cause division, trying to cause trouble, or somebody with a hidden agenda. Again, John said, believe not every spirit. But try the spirits. Try the spirits. Don't try it. Don't test it with feelings. But test it. Try it against the word of God. Try the spirit against the word of God and see if it matches up. Make sure that things check out. You see that all the time in troubled relationships. Oh, and it's so hard to see. Especially those that you love, whether, whether it be a, a man or a woman that's getting misused and mistreated and abused. And, and, you know, when you see it and you see the signs and you see them getting abused verbally, uh, physically, you know, just you see what's taking place and how they're just deteriorating. But then it's like you try to talk sense into them, but then they come back. But, oh, but they just make me feel so, so good and so loved. You know, it doesn't matter all the stuff they're doing. All they do is give me one rose or, or, or buy me one thing and stuff. And I just feel, you know, I just feel like things are really going to turn around. And 
it's like, no, they're not. This person is, is toxic. This person is bad. And all you're doing is going off that feeling. You're not seeing the signs. You're not seeing this, this, and this, how it's not matching up. And so that's how it goes with the word of God. Don't just test things based off of feeling. Taste things, base things based on the scripture, what the word of God says. If it's true or not true. I remember the first time we came here to this church, we felt the love of God. We felt the love of God. We felt the presence of God. But we also knew that they believed, that the Perrys believed, the leadership believed the Bible from cover to cover. And the same thing with Brother Perry and them. When we had our meeting, when we met, they're asking us questions. What are they doing? They're trying the spirit based on scripture. You know, they're just not worried about just putting somebody up here just to check off a box. It may check off every box, but if it doesn't check the most important box, which is the doctrine, which is the scripture, then throw the person away. And that's just the way it has to be. Test it. Try by the word of God. Amen. Amen. Genesis 27, 17 says, And she gave the savory meat and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. And he came unto his father and said, My father, he said, Here am I. Who art thou, my son? He's asking, who are you? Just like many people ask today, are you a Christian? Is he a Christian? Are you a man or a woman of God? Is this a good church? Is this a good church? Am I really going to get the word here? Am I really going to get Bible teaching, foundational truths, true teaching, not just opinions, but what the word of God says? He's asking, who are you? What are you? Who are you? Are you real? Just like the questions people ask today or or questions they should ask before going to church or finding a church. You know, what do they believe? What's going on? You know, if I'm going to move to another state, I want to find me a church. That should be the first priority. It used to be the first priority of families before they move, but now it's become something else. It's become money or whatever the reason is. But before the right questions were asked, what what, what do you believe? You know, what do you believe about this? What about, you know, salvation? What about the Holy Ghost? What do you, you know, the baptism? Is it for today? Do you believe it's just for another time? You know, and all this stuff. And so asking the question. And seeing if it lines up with what the word of God says. Then verse 19 says, And Jacob said unto his father, I'm Esau, thy firstborn. We know Jacob was lying. I'm Esau. I have done according as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat my, my venison, that thy soul may bless me. So he's saying, I, I, I'm, I, Yeah, I, I'm a Christian. Yeah. I'm a believer just like you. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Glory to God. I'm a believer just like you. You know, I was raised in this thing, and, you know, my my roots go back to so-and-so and and all this and that, da-da-da, all this stuff. It does all this. Let me pour into your life. Let me feed you. Come on. Come come sit at my table. Let Let me feed you. Let me pour into your life, he's saying. Let me sell you my books. Let me sell you my merchandise. Let me, let me convince you here. Let me talk this Christian lingo here so you can, you can kind of identify with me. And then Isaac said, well, how is it that thou hast found it so quickly? Verse 20, so quickly, my son. And he said, because the Lord, thy God brought it to me. See, there's no shame. There's no fear. He's something, something's not right. See, something's not right in, in, in Isaac. He's feeling something's off. Something's not right. But this guy's saying the right stuff. But still something's not right. And so he's, he's trying. He's trying to ask the right questions. You know, he's, he's asking questions. Who are you and this and that. You know, he wasn't expecting his son to lie to him. Just like people would not expect preachers or Christians to lie to him. Right? If I'm making a business deal with a Christian man or Christian business, I'm not expecting to get cheated. Or taken advantage of. But he's just asking the right questions here. He's trying to anyway. And so he, he's like, man, it, it, normally I've done this before. I taught you how to do this. This doesn't just happen just like that. How did you do it so fast? This is, you know, even for you, this is a record right here. And he's like, oh, God did this. 
This is from God. This is God. He, he, he must have put this together. This must be in, in the will of the Lord. He, he's made this happen here. This appointment is divine. This is divine and stuff like that. So he's coming in there, throwing the name of the Lord. The Lord, your, thy God, brought it to me. Thankfully, we know later how the story goes, how later, in, and this is for another time, but later, thank, thank God, that it's not the Lord thy God, but then it becomes his God as well, talking about Jacob. But anyway, back to the message. And Isaac said unto Jacob, come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be my son, my very son Esau, or not. So things is just not checking out. Something's not right about this. He's saying the right stuff. You know, sometimes you, li- you may be listening to something on TV or on the radio or a song or, or somebody, and, and it's sounding right, but then something's said and something's just quite off a little bit. And so you're trying to inquire. You're trying to figure this out, trying to do research. And so he, he just something is off. And then so he goes, just come over here. Let me, let me touch you because I know that Jacob's smooth. So he, th- this, this is going to tell me the truth right here. So the Bible says, he begins to feel him. So he begins to touch him, his arm, his hands. Deep down inside, there's still something not right, though. It's not right. And he's feeling something was missing. But I'm not sober-minded, so I'm just going to go off of the feelings. My eyesight is not good, so I'm just going to have to go by feelings to see if I'm right. It's not always right to go by feelings. We ought to know that. That's a dangerous place to be, and that's where he was. He was going off a feeling. That's all he had to go by. And that's what he was going off of. And it just, it was, it felt right, but something was wrong. I guess he could ask more questions. You know, maybe questions that only him and Esau would know, just to inquire more. You know, where were you in 95, you know, or whatever. What's the secret password to this? Whatever the case is. But that's where he stopped. Genesis 22, 27, 22, it says, And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, The voice, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. The voice. The voice. The voice. But then the hands. Something's not matching up. I, this, is, this is something I just thought about, and I hope Sister Susie don't get embarrassed, but I think she said she had a dream or something. <laughs> and uh, she was, I don't know if she was running or something happened, but she went to grab somebody that she thought was Brother Perry. But it wasn't, you know, Brother Perry. That had, she said the arms were skinny or something, and she freaked out, and she, like, threw him off to the side. and Like, oh, you know, you're not my husband. And I think it was a dream or something. But something didn't match up. Something didn't match up. Something didn't add up. You know, you face those situations where something's just not adding up, and you can't quite put your finger on it, but it's not adding up. That's why I'm preaching this word this morning is because the the more time that's going on, the more this is going to start to happen. And that's when we have to listen to the voice of God. Something wasn't right. Something was missing. And so he went by that. The big test is this. He was, he, was, he was nervous. He knew, he knew he's going he's gonna, to, because he's going to hear my voice. He was trying to tell his mom, my voice is not the same as Esau. It's going to give him away. She's like, no, he's going to go off of what he feels. And the devil knows that about certain people. He knows that most people don't know the Bible. He knows that most people don't even open the Bible unless the preacher says open it to this chapter, to this book. Other than that, they're not even going to open it. So he knows they're not going to be in that right state of mind. They're just going to go off of what they feel. So just make it feel like the real church. Just make it feel like real worship. Just make it feel like it's the real thing. And then they're going to swallow whatever you feed them. Just, just, just trust me on that. And the devil knows that exactly. And that's why I'm preaching this this morning to let us know everything was downhill in verse 23 because it says he discerned him not. Because his hands were hairy and his brother Esau's hands, just like his brother Esau, so he blessed him. 
all went downhill. The Bible says he discerned him not because what he felt overrode what he heard. What he felt overrode what he heard. I just feel so good in this place. But it overrode what the man just said. It wasn't matching up with scripture. But you don't understand. I feel so good in this place. But it's overriding what the word of God says. Run from that. Run from things like that. Run from doctrines like that. Run from theologies like that. Don't listen to those singers. Don't endorse those people. Don't endorse those things. It's time to call it the way it is. It's not judging. It's going off what the word of God says. It's trying the spirit, whether it be of God or not. That's what it says. It, it, it's, 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 it doesn't sound like truth. But the voice, but the voice. I know it doesn't sound, I know what he said, what they said might be a little off. But, but still the feeling I get, I, I feel so encouraged and I feel so, so moved. And so, so uh, when I exhale and I breathe in and breathe out, I just feel so special. I know it doesn't sound like something that would be in the Bible. I know it doesn't sound like something that, 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 that you know, would be in there. But still, the feeling was greater. His feelings overrode the voice. We have to listen to the voice. To know the voice of God, we're in trouble when we can't recognize the voice of God. Why does it, the Bible say, he that had an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit is saying, with a capital, what the Spirit of God is saying, what God is saying. So many voices out there, so many things out there. And the Bible says as the day approaches, there's going to be many false Christs saying, oh, Jesus appeared here. Oh, he's in the synagogue. He's there. He's in Israel right now. He's performing miracles. He's doing that. This is a prophet. This is Elijah. This is Moses. This is so-and-so. The Bible talks about that. It's going to be everywhere, a bunch of antichrists. Why? Because once you listen to what they have to say, it won't line up. But you don't understand. He does miracles. You don't understand. He heals. Healed. This person was sick and he put his hand and they got healed. It has to be God. No, he's not going to go against the word if it's really God, of God. It's not going to contradict what we know. Study to show thyself approved. Knowing how to divide. Knowing how to know. It's dangerous when we ignore the truth. Dangerous when we ignore sound doctrine or what we know because we're going off of a feeling. Again, the devil knows it has to feel right. The devil knows it has to feel right. Feel like the real deal. Just like those nasty vegan plant burgers. Make them taste like real meat. Yeah, you know, if you eat that, you like that, I, you know, I'm good. You know, I'm not preaching against that, but I'm saying make it taste. I mean, that's the slogan, right? That's the Propaganda is it tastes just, you can't taste the difference. You know, you see the Burger King, the Impossible Whopper, and, and they got the test of, you know, can you taste the difference? Oh, no, it tastes like the real thing. That's exactly what the devil's trying to do. That's exactly what he's out to do. We're almost done. Verse 24 said, art thou my very son Esau? He said, I am. And he said, bring it to me, and I will eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near to him, and he did eat, and he brought him wine, and he drank. And here it is. We got past the, 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 the voice, nervous time. We got past the feeling. Now what about the final test? Is he going to spit this out and realize it's goat? Or is he going to eat what I'm selling because he believes me? Here's the final test. Where's my venison? Oh, here it is. And I believe for a minute he's nervous. He's about to put it in his mouth and he's eating and he's chewing. Oh, I know. He's got to be nervous. What's he going to do? What, what's he going to do? Is he going to get mad? Is this is going to give me away? Nope. The Bible says he ate it. Everything was fine. Everything was good. That's what the devil does. Are these people going to buy what I'm selling? Have I made it look so real that they're just going to eat whatever I feed them, whatever trash I feed them, whatever trash doctrine, theology I feed them? Are they so 
deceived by what I've said that they're just going to take it all in and just not even study. They're not even going to read. They're not even going to line it up. And that's where he's at. Just eating, eating. He believed that that goat was the venison that he was supposed to have. And we all know that it matters what we put in our stomach spiritually. If it matters physically, it matters spiritually. The devil knows that more than anybody. A person that doesn't read the Bible anymore, a person that doesn't pray anymore, a person that hasn't come to church in a long time, won't be able to tell the difference. And so whatever's fed to them, they're going to eat it. Unfortunately. It matters. And his father Isaac said unto him, come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his raiment and blessed him and said, see, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. Last Bethany, she get on the piano, on the keys. Deception always comes by imitation. We see this in nature with both prey and predator. There's these butterflies that look like owls or look like birds to distract other birds. Or there's, you, you know, there's fish down there that look like rocks to entice other fish. I mean, there's deception comes by imitation. Praying mantises that look like leaves or tree limbs to, you know, attract prey and and the Bible says what we just read, what the title of this message is, be sober, be vigilant. Be sober, be vigilant. Vigilant. Now, again, I know this is not a tip, what some would consider a typical Sunday morning message, evangelistic, you know, super exciting. But we are to be sober and to be vigilant. Sober and vigilant. It's time to see things as they really are. Many, many, many are falling away. And many will fall away because people are not calling things as they are because of one thing, fear of judging. You hear that word all the time. Don't judge me. Oh, you're just judging. Why'd you get so judgmental? Oh, here you go, being judgy again. Oh, you're judging what I'm doing. You're judging my life. I'm a Christian just like you. I go to church just like you. Now you're judging. Now you're trying to get all spiritual. Now you're gonna trying to get all high and mighty, all holy. Now you're acting like you're better than me, this and that. Well, when you judge something, is you form an opinion or a conclusion about that person, which sometimes you do form a conclusion of somebody prematurely. And that is a form of, of bad judging, you know. Somebody walks through the doors, you know, I'm sure I was judged when you first met me. Just, I mean, that just happens, you know, based on looks, based on background, based on everything. You look at somebody and you already form your opinion from them. But that's not the judging I'm talking about. We're talking about judgment based on Scripture. It's not an opinion. It's not something I'm, I'm, I'm opinionated about and just thinking, okay, because you... You come from this background, and this is what you're going to do. No, this is based off Scripture. The Bible says bitter water and sweet water do not come from the same fountain. I'm not judging you. That's what the Bible says. I'm forming this based off what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. Now, you call it judging whatever. I'm just saying this is what the book says. Now, I'm not saying that and then doing it myself. That'd be wrong too. But people have confused it. You may know somebody. And see, this is where it gets, this is, this is where I feel the, the, the heart of it too is this morning is that you may know somebody that's in that very situation that's been deceived. And I know it can be a very difficult, very touchy thing and subject. You can't just approach somebody, especially if they've been in, the, in, in being a Christian for some time. You can't just approach them any, any way and just start talking and stuff you have to approach the right way I understand that it may be a difficult thing to do especially when a person feels like they're good oh I'm good but you know they're not I'm good but their actions are showing that they're not good but they're good and you can bring a scripture to them and they'll quote it they'll quote the rest of it you know but it's still not lining up with the word of God and so they're like oh yeah I'm good oh yeah 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 everything's fine I'm good but something's off and you know it 
and then we back off because it's touchy. We don't want it to blow up, and we know it can get ugly, and I know there's times and there's seasons for that. But I believe this message is coming at a timely time because I know that the Lord is going to give you the words you need to start reaching some of these people. As I said earlier, it can even be somebody that has led you to the Lord, but they're just not the same anymore. Oh, and that just breaks your heart. You used to talk about the Lord and, I mean, spend time and hours talking about the Lord, but now it's just not the same. And it hurts you because you know they've been deceived and you know that they're being deceived and they're swallowing all this other stuff because they're not sober, they're not vigilant, or they're not both. And it just tears you up because you, you, you don't know how to bring it up because the first thing, again, judgment and this and that, or, or they're good. But I believe the Lord's brought this this morning because he's going to use some of us to reach those people. See, God's a loving God. And even though they may reject him out of ignorance and all this stuff, he's still going to try and reach to the very end. To the very end. And he's going to use some of you. But I know it takes wisdom and it takes love. Love. Love lifted me, right? When nothing else could work, love lifted me. It wasn't hollering and screaming. It wasn't throwing a Bible in my face and saying, you did it. It was, it was love, words, of, words that were seasoned with salt, words that came at the right time, words led of the Lord. And I believe that's what he's going to do. I'm not just saying that. I'm going to invite you to stand this morning.